The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Canada's biggest city suddenly needs a new mayor. Would you take the job if you really thought you could win it? Would you be willing to put your name forward even if you didn't think you could win? Most people wouldn't, and tonight we'll find out what stops many qualified people from putting their names forward for higher office and the challenges they face when they do. Then, certified financial planner Shannon Lee Simmons is here on her new book that walks us through how to make, as the title of her book suggests, No Regret Decisions. It's Wednesday, March 8th, and that's next on The Agenda. Every few years, the calls go out. Candidates wanted, of all types and stripes, to run for elected office, federally, provincially, and municipally. It's actually pretty remarkable when you think about it. Anyone who wants to put their name forward can, just like that, even though probably 90% of the people that do are going to lose. To take the plunge and try to get the job requires a ton of effort, <clears throat> sacrifice, and more. With us now on what's actually involved in running for office, let's welcome Todd McCarthy. He is the Progressive Conservative member for Durham. Amber Morley is here. She's Toronto City Councillor for Ward 3 at Etobicoke Lakeshore. Chloe Brown, who ran for Mayor of Toronto in the last municipal election. And on the line, Sean McAuliffe, contributing columnist at the Toronto Star and co-founder of Spacing Magazine. And it's great to have you three first-timers here in our studio. And Sean, thanks for being there on the line from your place. I want to just, let's do some quick background here. Todd, you ran for Queen's Park for the first time in 2011. What happened? Well, I was uh, part of a team of PC candidates. Cut to uh, the chase. What happened? <laughs> we had a wonderful campaign. Cut to the chase. What happened? And uh, I did not win the seat that year. What happened Steve? in 2014? Once again, I did not win the seat. 2018, <laughs> you didn't run. That's um, right. I, I was nominated, but I stepped aside to uh, continue to lead my law firm, Flaherty McCarthy, you were, and you, to do a lot of trials all over the province uh, that particular yeah. year. Jim Flaherty, Christine Elliott, Jim that's Flaherty, your law Christine firm. Elliott. Proud okay. to say that uh, I was uh, a member of the firm that they founded, and it now it was Flaherty Dow Elliott and McCarthy, and now it's Flaherty McCarthy LLP. Okay. 2022, you finally... Finally! You yes, through. finally, that Steve, was the, yes. Now, yes. Th there might be some people who would say, uh, God is trying to tell me by two losses <laughs> and, a, and stepping out that I, this maybe is not the line of work for me. Why did you not come to that conclusion? Well, well first of all, you're talking to a litigation lawyer, so <laughs> we, uh, we never stop fighting till the fight is done or won. There you go. Uh, and if at first you don't succeed, you appeal. Now, that's, <laughs> that's the trial courts. That's the appeal courts. Uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter is I believe in public service in all its forms. And I always was able to uh, gather a great team of volunteers and supporters. And when you have that kind of energy and that common cause, it just keeps you going. So when I was asked, I came back again. And But I'll tell you, Steve, it feels a lot better to win than you, the alternative. You don't say. <laughs> That's I right. believe it. Okay. Yeah. Were you successful the first time out I the gate? I not successful I know you the weren't. first time out the gate. What happened? Um, I finished with 10,985 votes. That number is seared into my mind. Which election I, was that? In 2018. Okay. That was the first time I ran, the first time I lost. For Toronto City Hall? For Toronto City Hall, for the seat that I now occupy. And why did you try again? I knew I could do it, and it needed to be done. So it, it, It's up. interesting you say that, because one of the absolute truisms of City Hall is that you can't beat an incumbent. And you did. I did. So I guess it's not a truism anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it doesn't make it any less true, but it makes your victory quite extraordinary. Thank you. Why do you think it happened? Um, a number of factors came to play in Etobicoke Lakeshore. I'm a lifelong resident. I've got deep roots and I've served the community there. I, I along with Todd, I believe very deeply in public service. And um, so that's always been my, uh, the type of work that I've occupied myself with. So I've got a lot of connections, a lot of networks. And frankly, the incumbent counselor had been in for 19 years. Mark um, Grimes. Mark Grimes was the incumbent counselor. And uh, uh, there was a very large appetite in the community for change. And I knew I could be uh, the kind of candidate that would bring the change that we needed. You referenced a few things there about money and networks. And we're going to mm -hmm. come back to that because that's quite important to our discussion mm -hmm. today. Chloe. You ran for mayor of Toronto last time. I did. And if memory serves, I don't know the exact number, as Amber does of her vote, but I think you got something like 34,000 votes. I did. Which is not bad for first time out the gate. No. <laughs> Why'd you run for mayor? 
Um, I just don't like to be bullied. Mm -hmm. And my stepfather taught me that, yeah, sometimes you got to take your licks, but sometimes you got to give them back. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ways that I've been involved in politics. Uh, I ran in 2016 against Michael Ford and the Ford machine. I ran against the Tory and the Tory machine in 2020. And it's just a way for me to remind regular citizens that you're a part of this process, the elected officials are regular people, and we are the checks and balances. You, you got 34,000 votes, which is a pretty good number for first time out. Thanks. John Tory got 340,000, so mm -hmm. you knew going into it you weren't going to win. Yes. Why'd you do it? Because courage isn't courage isn't avoiding problems, it's going in knowing that you're licked and trying anyways. Mm -hmm. And growing up in Rexdale, I've grown up with so many negative messages about who we are and the things that we stand for that I needed John Tory to know that that conversation was done. There's kids in Etobicoke, Scarborough, North York, and downtown Toronto that are worthy of being heard mm. outside of election seasons. And that's why I took that platform, because we deserved better than what we were getting. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, this is where we get the journalist in here to come in and now. And actually, you know what, Sean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Uh... I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball here because you wrote a column a little while ago saying that you had actually thought about running for mayor of Toronto and had some people approach you about doing so, but ultimately you didn't do it. So let's explore that a little bit. Why did you want to run in the first place? Well, I did, I did a couple of degrees in political science, you know, in university. I always thought, you know, public service, politics would be a natural thing to do. And then uh, in the last election uh, last summer, I was approached by one of those machines, you know, those uh, those kind of uh, people that will put together a campaign for you. Um, because I've sort of been a bit vocal, a vocal critic of Tory uh, in my column. Uh, not always a critic, though. Um, and so I thought about it for two weeks. And I realized the um, the, the, the commitment was beyond what I could, I think, pull off. I would have had to quit all my jobs. I'm a freelancer in everything I do, whether it's writing for the Star or teaching at University of Toronto. I would have had to quit all that with the, you know, a high risk of not winning. And then I would have had to start my life all over again, uh, you know, from scratch, sort of. Um, so I have so much admiration for people who, who run, um, no matter what political stripe they are, because they put so much of their uh, personal life um, on the line. And it's not just the money part and the income and, and stopping your life. You suddenly open up your, your life, your private life, to not just legitimate criticism, but an incredible amount of hate. That's the, you know, nature of the, the sad nature of the way it is now um, and you have to have this kind of thick skin uh, against that and and I think I don't have it and I really <laughs> admire people uh, the people you know sitting on this panel who have it um, well tell uh, me this I don't know I don't know where you got it from who 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 approached you to run for mayor of Toronto I think they were kind of like a melange of center-left liberals you, you want to put a name to it no really. <laughs> well you said it was a if machine like what, what? What does um, that mean? Uh, they are kind of they're, they're people that work for um, sort of lobby groups and and think tanks that will often take time off uh, during elections and go work on campaigns. So that's kind of how the machine part of the machine works. People work uh, these sort of day jobs uh, with the knowledge that they'll jump onto a campaign. Um, and then they had some access to um, some political money, people who would back a mayor against John Tory, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, let's pursue this a little bit because this is, uh, and Amber, you raised this a moment ago, access to network, access to money, access to a machine, a lot of people think without that, you can't be successful. Todd, obviously, you had a political party behind you, you had a fundraising apparatus behind you, uh, you know, you had a leader who was obviously quite concerned that you win, so you had all that going for you. What machine was backing you? I built my machine. Uh, my community was my machine. Uh, my community has shown up for me in incredible ways over the years, encouraged me, you know, in my political aspirations in terms of advocacy and, and organizing. But it's a coalition of, of groups, I presume, yes? Um, yeah, I mean... So who's in that coalition? So I, when I first decided I was going to run, I br brought together about 20 of my closest personal friends, mentors, and, you know, um, 
colleagues, professional colleagues, to say, I'm thinking about this crazy thing and what do you all think about this? Would you support me through this endeavor? Um, and they were all very, you know, um, supportive and, and um, enthusiastic about me taking this on. And so just knowing they had my back, it gave me the confidence to go forward, to continue to draw on and mobilize the networks that I had already been building since I was a teenager in my community through doing organizing. I had been um, pulling together all candidates debates and, you know, mobilizing young people around trying to get a community center and space for ourselves to you know um, be able to do things other than hang out with idle hands uh, you know in the neighborhood um, and so yeah it really was an effort that took quite some time for me to identify um, who I could work with there was a group called women win Teo that was organized by former counselor current MPP Kristen Wong Tam uh, amongst many others um, including Velma Morgan who works with Operation Black Vote Canada was one of the founding members and um, they trained a, a group of about 20 young women who had political aspirations in 2017 to understand what it takes to run a winning campaign. So folks like Peggy Nash, other professionals and experts mm -hmm. in the field came through and, and helped us understand what it took. I wonder if you had any of that behind you when you ran for mayor. No. <laughs> None of that. You had no. no coalition or machine or something. I'm a policy analyst. I eat policy for <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> and that was my advantage. Um, I work at... Toronto Metropolitan University right now and I evaluate a variety of federally funded projects that are focused on the future of work. Mm -hmm. So it's like all I really had to do was bring the work table to the platform. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I thought was a lot easier than building a machine behind me because I am the machine. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, so, yeah. you, knowing you a little as I do, uh, I can confirm that. You are the machine. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, ta again, you're a little different in as much as you did have this apparatus behind you, but, but let's approach it from this standpoint. You can't just decide, I'm going to be the candidate for the progressive conservatives in such and such a riding and therefore it happens. You actually have to earn the right to be the PC standard bearer. How do you do that? Talk to us about networks, money, access to people, organization, all that. Well, I prefer to call all those things relationships, Steve. Okay. Life is about relationships. Politics is about relationships. And governing is about relationships. And it's, it's listening more than talking. Uh, now, what I did run for and win a seat on the school board in 1994 in Durham. Um, and so I definitely can relate to uh, Chloe and Amber about that endeavor because of course you're not affiliated with a party mm -hmm. so you do you do have to put together your own team then when you run provincially or federally as i have of course you're part of a team with the leaders as leading that team and leading the message and your job is as jim flaherty taught me to be part of that team because politics is a team sport at the provincial and federal level did you run federally and, as well and i, I did i did run federally in 2019 run? yes so so you lost that, that one too yeah okay so but steve <laughs> I, I, forgot I, I as i said on election night when i won you know, on june 2nd i'm batting 400 which mm. isn't bad in baseball so five elections two wins that's bad 400. <laughs> that's not okay. bad. Yeah, you, that's you, not bad. You and that's Ted not Williams, bad. Yeah. pretty good. Okay, that's all so, right. But, you know, Premier Ford had a message that he delivered centrally, the five priorities of our campaign, and then our job is to make sure we deliver that message locally. One of the reasons and, people yeah. don't run, Todd, is yes. that they think they can't afford to do so. Right. So tell us this and be as specific as you can. How much money do you have to raise in order to mount an effective competitive campaign for the provincial legislature. Well, the, the great news in, in Canada is that when you run provincially or federally, you know, $100,000 raised for the writ period will allow you to be a very well-funded campaign. There won't be anything that you can't do in terms of office space, brochures, social media, signs. Um, all of those things are possible. And But bearing in mind, I mean, if you were running for a similar position for state legislature or Congress in the United States, you'd need seven-figure money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And whereas here we have, of course, um, at, when you're part of a team, your, your job is to, to raise money for your own local riding association and campaign, but also for the central party because you're part of that team and you benefit from the central message and you benefit from how that's messaged and conveyed by the leader in our case. Well, it's two ways Premier Ford. If you yes. got a good leader, it's a benefit. If you got that's a turkey right. as a leader, you're going to get dragged down by there, that. There, there, where well, there are always the safe seats for a particular party, mm -hmm. but definitely the, the leader is very, very important to your success yeah. for sure. Let's, yes. uh, Amber, let's talk money. How mm -hmm. much did you have to raise in order to mount a competitive campaign? Um, the first time out, we raised around 50000 Um the Where'd you get it from? 
Um, community members, family, friends, um, like in, and in, in, mostly in, small donations. Like what size? Uh, two fifty was the average donation. Two hundred fifty dollars. Um, yep, in both my campaigns, uh, we had folks initially that were hyper local, and then as our campaign grew, uh, as they do, right over time, as you get closer to election day, uh, we started having progressives across the whole city of Toronto who wanted to see more voices like mine at the around the table. And so folks came out from the woodworks. Um, mm -hmm. I had the support of an organization called Progress Toronto, um, which uh, did and a lot of- they gave you some money? They didn't give me money, but they um, championed my campaign in some ways as a third party advertiser. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were able to help to bring some support and you know donations and that kind of thing forward from the progressive community. So in, in the 50 grand the year you lost, how about the year you won, what'd you raise? I think we got closer to 60, 65, and actually we're giving some money back to the city mm -hmm. of Toronto. Um, we were very mindful uh, and very fiscally responsible with our finances. Also, you know, growing up with a, not a lot, you learn to do a lot with a little. So, gotcha. Now, uh, I think John Tory raised $2 million when he ran for mayor. How, <laughs> how close did you get to that? Not even close. Um, <laughs> I put aside one paycheck uh, because I work in nonprofit government services. You're used to just having small budgets mm -hmm. and having to make miracles out of them. <laughs> so that's what I did. I just, I just continued my day job, <laughs> to be honest. And did, I, you, did you raise money though? After the debates, I raised like four thousand dollars. Who'd you get to give you that money? Just people who really love the debates. <laughs> really? They saw yeah. you when they decided to contribute. Yes, and that's that was the problem. Like all of us thought John Tory was too big to fail and then those debates changed people's minds. And this is where like I leverage traditional media, social media to get my message out as opposed to spending dollars on it because social media is free. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was one of those things where it's like I knew I wasn't going to win, but I knew I had to make an impact. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do you stretch $2,000 to reach as many people as possible? And that's having a good message that resonates with your audience. And that's what I did. And let's remind people, you, I mean, Tori won, obviously. Gil Penalosa came second. You came third. Yeah. <laughs> Having never run for mayor before, you came third. Yeah. You defeated, I don't know what, like 40 other people? For... Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's a lot of people who ran, and yeah. you came ahead of all of them. Here's Sean writing in uh, the Toronto Star last September. There's a reason politics is becoming a rich person's game, and that's bad for democracy, too. If you live in Toronto, your mayor, premier, and prime minister are all of inherited wealth greater than most Canadians will ever know. Regardless of their politics, anybody who isn't rich and decides to run for any office is making tremendous personal sacrifices deserving of respect. Sean, I want to pursue that with you. Do you really believe you have to be wealthy to win? Um, I believe it happens a lot. Um, obviously, one of our panelists here um, shows that it, it is possible to be a regular person um, and win. Um, but when you just look across the, the landscape, there's so many, you know, relatively comfortable, wealthy people that ran um, that that lose that that can't that can't kind of mount that sustained campaign. Like before, John Tory was was mayor. He was uh, for a few years. He was the drive time host on one of the AM stations in Toronto, uh, which is sort of like, uh, uh, I guess it's a full-time gig, uh, but maybe not for someone of, of John Tory's stature, but he had the ability to kind of do that gig to um, to get his name out there and, and kind of become this this fixture in people's lives. Well, that's a well-paying gig, though, Sean. That, that morning and afternoon radio are well-paying gigs, not the rest of the day, but, but he would have made a living doing sure. that. <laughs> Seriously here, do, do you feel we're at a point right now where if you don't have a great deal of wealth, you can't run and win. I worry about that, you know, and I worry because because of the, uh, the 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 personal toll it takes on people. When I wrote my last book, Frontier City, I went for walks with uh, underdog candidates running for city council, um, and most of them had their own self-made machines, um, uh, like Amber was talking about, uh, community members, not that much money, and most of the people I walked with lost. Uh, it was the incumbents that won. It was some of the kind of wealthier campaigns, um, and there are there's lots of anomalies across. You know, when you when when the, when the, the little person. And wins, um, but um, I think it's something we should we should really think about and watch and 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 and, and see if if it is going in that direction. Todd, uh, I'll get you to weigh in on this because I mean we have had bears in Toronto who have not been people of immense wealth. Now, as it happens right now, Justin Trudeau, Doug Ford, John Tory, uh, all did have ample resources uh, at their disposal to run. 
Do you think we're at a point where if you don't have money, you can't expect to win? I, I think the opposite, actually. I think uh, we, we can be proud in Canada that at all levels of government, we have people from all walks of life and um, different um, financial brackets who can and will be successful. And money in terms of campaigns doesn't play the role that it does in the United States because only personal donations are allowed and there's a cap on any one donation and there's a cap on spending. And I, I'm, I think we can all be very, very proud of that. We, well, we have okay. a very gotta, accessible system. I got to push back a little bit on that. All right. I mean, Doug Ford had a big event for 4,000 people the other day at the Toronto Congress Centre and raised a, I believe the technical term is, piss pot full of money at that event. 3500 bucks a ticket, I think. So No, no, uh, wow. it was $1,500. $1,500, sorry. It was $1,500 a ticket. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that our party, the, the PC party, raises small amounts from many, many people. But not that night. And, and well, that, that was an event that was a province, a, 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 a provincial-centric approach. Everyone from all over the province of Ontario was represented at that event in Toronto. Uh, but for the most part, and, and that's a... Uh, you know, a, a post-election, once-a-year type of event. For the most part, our party raises small amounts from large numbers of people. And so the $25 and uh, $50 donations mean the world to us, and um, and they're welcomed. And that's what sustains our party and the messaging associated with it. I'll, I'll get you on this, to, but, but before I do, I, he's not wrong about that last part, you know. I mean, there are pretty strict fundraising limits in place that don't allow people... I mean, we're so not like the United States, it's not funny. Mm -hmm. You know, no, you can't, as a rich person, uh, hand a check of $25 million to Todd McCarthy as you could to a senator, uh, you know, someone running for the Senate in the United States. Right. Having said that, do you think we're at a point where if you don't have money, you don't have a chance? It's not that you don't have a chance, but the question of what you'll be able to do with your life after mm -hmm. is very big. One of the reasons that I've been considering my running in a by-election is because people have been warning me, like, I could be blacklisted from policy work if I don't follow the procedures of, you know, the Canadian establishment. And this is where, like, to his point, yes, the average person can contribute to a political party, but a $1,500 $1, ticket is... It's 90% of my rent. My rent is 1610. Mm -hmm. I could not pay for access to the premier if I wanted to because then I risk homelessness. And this is where I feel that political parties have done a disservice to everyday residents because it is pay for play when it comes to meeting your political representative. Well, okay, let me, again, I, I don't think that's I don't think yeah. that's true at Go all. Ahead, Todd. I don't think that's true at all. First of all, there were 4,000 people in the room, so you're you're not going to get much face time with the premier or any member. We 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 were really responsible for making sure that the people from our ridings were looked after by ourselves, right? I I obviously sat with my group of people and uh, and they enjoyed themselves very much. And and yes, there's lots of networking involved with that number of people in the room. You're not going to get access. And that's uh, a, that so, is, so he talks right about that. That is a once a year thing. Right. That, that big dinner is a once a year fundraiser. Uh, the average you know, person can't even afford that once correct, a year. Correct. <laughs> No, that's right. But they yeah. do they have other opportunities to participate? Yeah, they do. They have $25 spaghetti dinners. And they, they also have the chance not to pay anything because we value our volunteers, Steve. You know, the great thing about the political process is it's time, talent, and treasure. And the, the great joy is that everybody gives in different ways. There's donors who may come to a dinner event, but they never knock on doors. They never seal envelopes or distribute literature. And then there's others who give hours and weeks at a time. And we're, and we're so honored to have them. They're, they're the ones who win the elections. Let's give Chloe a chance to come back on that. So time is a luxury. If you're working two to three jobs, what time do you actually have to be involved in party politics all year round? And that is a barrier. And this is something that I have been trying to inspire with my particular campaign. If you are willing to sacrifice two months to having your face seen and being put up for scrutiny, there's a lot of impact that you can make. And even after the election, it's like I've been connecting with people who want to who wanted to organize for me for 2026. That is something that I wouldn't have been able to get if I didn't risk putting myself up at the highest office and losing. 
And that's not something that everyone can afford to do. I'm only able to afford to do it because I'm a policy analyst, I'm making $66,000 a year, and I work from home. Mm -hmm. If those three things weren't in place, I wouldn't even be able to run as a working class person. And this is where working class needs to be redefined because there are working class people making $100,000 but they can't afford to take time off. And then you have people that don't make $100,000 and they don't even have the resources to get versed in the procedural language of elections. And those are two separate issues because yes, the average person can donate, but how much time do they actually get with their elected officials? A different story. Yeah. Sean, let me get you in here at this point because uh, there are actually no minimum qualifications you need to have to run for mayor of Toronto, yeah. or any city for that matter. Uh, but clearly there's a skill set you need. What's part of that skill set in your view? Uh, you need to know how to make policy in a very messy situation. Um, in the first uh, few months of John Tory's um, tenure back in 2014, um, his team was pretty new and it was kind of awkward to watch him run city council. Uh, he kind of, it, it, it didn't work so smoothly. And then they got the machine uh, going um, really well. The team kind of figured out how, how Toronto City Council works. City councils in across Ontario are kind of interesting beasts, whereas federally and, and provincially, you know, policies made in caucus behind the scenes. It's really the sausage is made in front of us at city council. So for a lot of people, they see all the arguing and it's like, oh, it's so messy. Uh, but actually, that's kind of sometimes what it makes it interesting is you see the thing get made. And to negotiate that in real time with the cameras rolling and people watching um, can be a real challenge. So I think you you really learn on the job for that. That's why often a lot of councillors kind of go up into running for mayor because they know how this particular political beast works. Right. Well, okay, let me follow up on that. We've got about five minutes to go here, and, and, I, and I'm very interested in following up on Chloe's kind of, the bar to entry in her view is too high. Having said that, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. You know, I have heard people say, Sean, you might be one of them, actually, uh, who say something like, you know, I haven't run for anything before. I don't have a fundraising team in place. I don't have a coalition of groups or organizations that are, you know, that I've spent years putting together. I'm frustrated that I'm unable to mount a bid to run for mayor of the city uh, or run for premier, run for prime minister or whatever. And I guess my question is, is it reasonable for a candidate or a would-be candidate to feel that way, do you not have to have done something in this field in order to have a reasonable shot to participate? You tell me. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, we have we have politicians who are lifelong politicians. Some of those lifelong politicians will rail against lifelong politicians. <laughs> um, that's the only real job they've had. You know, if you if you've if you've run your own business, if you've worked out in the world, uh, if you've been a pipe fitter, um, these are some of the voices that we never hear uh, or rarely hear about um, in our in our elected chambers. So yeah, living your life uh, in this place that we all hang out together um, is experience enough. Um, and then you got to learn on the job really quickly. Well, okay, Amber, I'll follow up with you. And again, this may be a ridiculous example, but I'm going to throw it out there just to be provocative for the heck of it. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody wants to be the anchor of the CBC National News. Mm -hmm. They never went to journalism school. Mm -hmm. uh, they have never worked for a newspaper or a radio station in the past. Uh, they've decided at the age of 40 that I think it might be interesting to go into journalism because I'm kind of interested in public affairs. And then they're shocked that when they go for an interview, the news director at CBC says, well, you kind of don't have any of the experience or you know, approach or attitude that you need to do this job, what makes you think you could be the anchor of the national? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that's a good analogy, mm. but, but speak to me, if you would, about, you know, sort of the bar for entry to being the mayor of Toronto. I mean, it's not yeah. an entry-level job. No, not at all. Um, but I think there's a lot of learning that happens, as Sean mentioned, right? You, you kind of learn through being, and uh, times are changing now. Uh, we traditionally, you know, would see my mom's a baby boomer, right? She had one career and that was it. Um, our generation is not, that's not what it is anymore. Um, and so folks are continuing to change their, their vocations and 
taking their, I think, trying their hand at different things that they might have interest in or skills around. Um, the only thing I guess I would say is I didn't have experience as a politician. Certainly, obviously, whoever does until you get elected. Um, I did work as a staffer for five years at City Hall. So, you know, I felt a high degree of confidence that I had the right approach and attitude to get the job done. Um, but my entire team uh, at City Hall now, we're, we're continuing to staff up and build the team out. But none of them are coming at this job with political experience or experience on the floor of council and I specifically selected them because I wanted folks who had the right kind of approach to the job uh, who are intelligent, curious, lifelong learners, who had an excellent ability to take care of our residents and to, you know, um, dig into the work and learn on the job, as Sean talked about, because um, there's no training in this role. You really learn by doing, learn and by doing. some of us excel in that. And Todd, I guess I'll give you the last word here, is uh, apropos of Chloe's point, is the bar to entry to politics still too high? I, I don't think it is too high. I think actually th that's a myth. I mean, I met model parliamentarians, the students recently. They came to Queen's Park. I was honored to go to each table. And um, very idealistic young people, all different interests. And, and I encourage that. And a few of them said, well, you're a lawyer because we looked you up. Do you have to be a lawyer to be here? I said, absolutely not. Uh, and that, that's just a myth. The, the great thing is you, you only have to be 18 years of age and a citizen to put your name on a ballot municipally, federally, or provincially. Now, and, uh, am I going to look forward to seeing your name on a ballot for mayor uh, in the special by-election later in June? Yes. <laughs> You're going to run for Mayor of Toronto again? Yeah. Okay. Um, I got four months to process my own data and develop tools for the community. and. With three years, a lot can be done. So that's why I'm running, because democracy is not just about the mayor. It's about what the mayor can do for its people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm really just focused on, like, how do I let people understand, like, this is not just about Chloe. It's about what Chloe can do for her community that has taken care of her. Well, having said that, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to put the breaking news <laughs> banner on the bottom there, because Chloe Brown just announced right here on the agenda she's running for mayor of Toronto. OK, good. Uh, I want to thank all of our guests for uh, really a great discussion, uh, giving our viewers something, uh, uh, a lot to think about, actually. Todd McCarthy, the PC member for Durham, and Chloe Brown, former and future mayoral candidate in the city of <laughs> Toronto. Amber Morley's over here on my right side, the Ward 3 Etobicoke Lakeshore City Councillor. Sean McAuliffe, Toronto Star, uh, writing. Uh, you can read his stuff in, uh, as we used to call it, the Toronto Daily Star. <laughs> great discussion, everybody. Thanks so much. Ignoring problems, as we all know, does not make them go away. That is painfully true when it comes to money matters, where making bad choices can be very costly. Shannon Lee Simmons is a certified financial planner. She founded the New School of Finance and writes books that tackle the everyday challenges people face managing their money. Her new book is called No Regret Decisions, Making Good Choices During Difficult Times, and she joins us now on that timely topic. Great to have you here again. Oh, so glad to be here. Okay, a no regret decision is what? Uh, a decision that you can look back on no matter how high the stakes were and say, even if things didn't work out, that's the key. Because if things work out, whatever. But mm -hmm. if they didn't work out the way you wanted them to, you could still look back at the decision and say, huh, that was a good decision with a bad outcome and I wouldn't have done anything differently no matter what. How can it be a good decision if it's got a bad outcome? Well, sometimes luck plays a huge amount into it, right? So think about on the, like somebody who maybe took out a mortgage uh, at the height of the pandemic and it was a variable mortgage and the mortgage broker told them to do that and the parents told them to do that and the realtor told them to do that and they said, okay, well, this is 1.75%. That makes perfect sense to me. And now looking back, their mortgage payment has gone up by $1,400 a month, hmm. and they're scrambling. Did they make a bad decision in 2020? Yes. No. They didn't? I don't think so. I mean, hmm. how can you, if you're if you're not a financial expert, and every financial expert that you spoke to, the good information that you trusted, said to do this, and for a long time you were and looking historically, you, you know, variable rates were pretty good during the last decade, it would make sense to that person that, okay, I, this, isn't a, this isn't a bad decision. This is a decision that I, I dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's, and now I've I'm gotten gonna, unlucky. I'm going to challenge you on that. Great. You can say, 
it's a no regret decision. That's yes, right. my mortgage is a lot higher today than it was because of variable rate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a no regret decision, but it might have been a bad decision. Can you not say that? I think that I like that nuance. That Yes, I, you can say that because what I'm really saying here with no regrets is that I'm not sitting up at three in the morning with guilt about my decisions. Mm -hmm. And the no regret decision is important in our lives because there's a difference between someone looking back and being like, ha, huh, that was a bad decision, don't like the outcome, versus I'm bad with money. I can't, be tr I can't trust myself to make good financial choices going forward. I am a person who sucks at money. Like That's the kind of regret that seeps into our confidence and really impacts how we look forward in our life. And if you don't trust yourself to make good decisions when the stakes are high, then you're going to live a life of anxiety where you're worried that bad things are going to happen to you and that you're not equipped to make the choices to, to navigate those. And that's the difference. So someone looking back and saying, ha, huh, wish I did that differently, mm. but I it was the best I did at the time versus someone who looks back and says, that's my fault. That's the difference. Can I get personal here? What's your best no regret decision? How, well, I mean, having my kids, obviously. I mean, this is that the decision. I was thinking financially. Financially yeah. speaking, oh, that's a great question. I think um, when I was young, when I moved to the city, I rented in a place that I hated um, for very cheap, <laughs> and I saved up as much as I could, but it's a different rental market now, so I'm not saying that that is the same at mm -hmm. all. Um, this but it was, worked that way when you were there. It was that way when I was there, and I tried not to um, rent too expensive, even though I, I didn't like where I was living at the mm -hmm. time, and we saved up enough. Um, for a small down payment, and I bought something when I was like younger. We didn't have financial help from my folks, and it was just ours. But we did that because we lived very much in a place that I that I didn't love, with couches I hated and furniture I hated. But like it was okay. I was, I was young. But it turned into a good decision. That's right. Because it let you save money, and you ended up in a better place ultimately. It did. But okay. I do think young people today face different for sure. For, face for different sure. uh, economic realities. Well, these are the three phases of no regret decisions, which are early on in Shannon Lee Simmons' book. Number one is panic mode. Number two is the messy middle. And number three is your next normal. Okay, we're gonna walk through these. The panic mode is what? Right, so a uh, decision crisis, which is basically walking you through these kinds of decisions, are ones that have high financial stakes, high emotional stakes with a ton of uncertainty. So often, right away when they happen, you feel panicked. So take the pandemic, for example, like your life looks different. The kind of decisions we're talking about in this book are, the, are not like whether you order a pizza tonight. It's like, do I leave my partner? I just got diagnosed with a critical illness. Um, do I do IVF? Like these kinds of major life decisions, buying a house, going back to school, quitting your job. So your life looks different when you make those kinds of decisions. So panic, fear, anxiety, these are all part of it, overwhelm, these are all part of it. So the first part of the playbook, so to speak, is to make sure that you're not just making a reactionary panic-based decision. Mm -hmm. So a classic example, I talk about this, about myself even um, during the pandemic. Um, I live in Toronto. I have a postage stamp backyard, if you could even call it that. And, and you're still married. I'm still married, yeah. Despite everything you said in this book about how crazy your life was during the pandemic. You know, he's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and I grew up in the suburbs with a backyard. And so uh, that's always been like a thing for me. And uh, But it doesn't matter because we live in the city and then all of a sudden the parks are closed. And I have two little kids who can't go out, who don't have anywhere to play and can't I go to school. can't go to school, can't go to the park, can't go down the street. Like I started panicking that this was life forever. That's not true. We know that. But at the time I was panicking. And so I'm like, well, we need to move. I got a real estate agent. I started saying houses. It was bananas. I look back and I'm like, Shannon, you're like, what the heck? But I was so scared with how different, how high the stakes felt at the time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do the, make the best decision, but that wouldn't have been a good decision for me. Some of my clients, had the same exact thought, they moved, and they look back and they're like, that was the best decision I ever made. I would have been a person who looked back and said, I regret that decision. This is, I made a decision that was just reactionary based on my own panic at the time and not good for like long term. I also tried to quit the book like four times. Like, it was just a weird time for me, Steve. It was a weird time. <laughs> you, had, you, had, you had a sympathetic publisher who let you blow past deadlines. I sure and, did. And sure. you got the book done anyway. I got it done. No so regrets. it all worked yeah. out. That sounds like Doug Ford. Get it done. There you go. Okay, number two, the messy middle refers yes. to what? Okay, so this is the part of the, um, your decision making process where like you're kind of over it right? And you have to make decisions. So the first part is about making sure you're not reacting, you're calm, you've got the good information, you trust it, you're, you're not panicking. And the second part is like, okay, figure out what's important, 
control what you can. Make sure you don't, you know, screw yourself long-term financially or time-wise. Is that a technical term? Yeah, you know, it is. I learned it in my undergrad. <laughs> um, and then play your cards. So the messy missile is, middle is so messy because you're tired, you're over it, you want it to be done, and now you have to play your hand. And you don't want to because the stakes still feel high, but you've done all your work to make sure that no matter how this plays out, you're gonna be okay. So like if you are um, in the middle of a separation, that's a great example of how long it can go on too, right? And there's so much uncertainty, but at some point, push comes to shove, and you have to make a decision. So all you can do is make sure you've made the best decision you possibly can. Breaking up is really bad for your finances, isn't it? Yes, it very much is, which is not why I'm still married, but <laughs> it's a good motivation. Mean to suggest that. Yeah. It's good motivation. No, it is. Um, so again, I see a lot of I see a lot of separation and divorce um, mm -hmm. in my line of work, um, and uh, it's not. It's a roller coaster, even in the best of times. Yeah. It's a roller coaster, and financially, it's difficult for everybody. Number three, your new normal. Yes, and so uh, I like my, well, it's actually your next normal, or a new normal, next normal, but I, I like the term next normal because it's basically like what your life is gonna look like on the other side of this decision that you make, right? So whether it's quitting your job and going back to school, whether it's uh, retiring, whether it's you know having a kid, buying a house, whatever it is that's going on in your life, your life on your day-to-day -day life, your normal day-to-day -day is gonna look different than it did before, and do you like do you like that life that is playing out for you? And if you do like it, then it's easy to look back at these decisions and say, I'm so smart, let me go. <laughs> but if you don't like what your next normal looks like or your new normal, and it, it doesn't suit what you thought, that's when it's really easy to come and make those no regret decisions and you don't want to blame yourself. You have a nice analogy here in the book, which I am going to quote from right now. So Ooh. Sheldon, if you would, uh, board two, let's do that right okay, now. Okay, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> During the pandemic, many people use the phrase, quote, we are all in the same storm, but in different boats. Mm. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You need to find your boat. You need to seek support from the people in that boat. Why? Because if your boat is sinking and someone comes by on a yacht, no one on the yacht will understand your situation or the choices you made. The advice the people on the yacht give, alert the skipper, <laughs> isn't going to help you. The kind of understanding you need only comes from people in your boat. Okay. Play that out in real life terms. Give us yeah. an example of what that means. Yeah, I think it, so it's the chapter on um, how to get yourself out of panic mode and it's called creating a circle of care. And so what that means is often we have support people in our life that we go to for advice, right? We talk things through. And so a real life example of that might be, um, not to harp on the separation or the divorce, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, just because it's so uh, easily such an example of this. Let's say that you and your partner are going through a separation and you're trying to be amico, but it's hard and every single one of your support people is happily married. They are not necessarily in the same boat as you for this decision, mm -hmm. not in your life. This, isn't, this doesn't mean you need to like, well, I need a whole group, new group of friends or like my family, I can't trust them, no, no, no. But when you're making decisions around your separation, your divorce, you wanna be talking to other people who have gone through what you're going through or are currently going through what you're going through so you can compare notes, you can be a sounding board for each other and you can have empathy on a level that someone who is not going through what you're going through doesn't understand. And it's really helpful to take yourself out of panic mode because you feel seen, heard, understood. Plus, the type of information that you're getting from people who are in the same situation as you is helpful um, because they maybe did the same research as you, they're talking to the same types of people as you, like they, they've already been through it or they're going through it themselves. So that's what I mean when I say creating that circle of care, finding the people that are in the same situation as you, it doesn't mean forever, but it just means for whatever decision crisis you're facing, it's really helpful when you feel understood and you have a go-to group of people. You have a lot of really uh, challenging examples in the book of different circumstances people find themselves in. And, and I guess one of the hardest was, at least one of the, one of the ones I thought was the hardest, is the, is the woman who's the second wife whose husband dies mm, I know. and she has to, and she doesn't get on with the first wife and she's still, uh, you know, she's got stepchildren that yes, she, she would does. like to step be. Step grandkids and step stuff. Grandkids. Yeah. Okay, so when you talk about finding similar boats, that's a pretty specific example. Well, I mean, we make that joke, right? Yeah. So it's like starting a starting a support group. What is she yeah. called it something funny? It was like a, it was like went on Facebook to Google like ex ex wives of like a step grandparents dot com or something like mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, and so she actually one of the things that she ended up finding a support group, um, and she found it through social media by just like putting it out there and also asking um, some of the people that were in her life. So she was like chatting with the 
uh, estate lawyer and they're like, oh, this this group, this community group over here and like talking to other people. So when you put it out into the world, like I need to find people who are in the same situation as me. And she put it out there and then they ended up finding it. And she found a few women who were also had step grandkids and the, you know, the spouse and the, the partner had died. And now they were like feeling like they were intruding because the, 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 you know, it wasn't easy to get access to the grandkids mm -hmm. that they'd been grandparents for for years. And so it was really, really niche. These are all real examples, right? Oh, yeah. They're all, I mean... These are real people. I listened on my iPod and wrote them and cried. And yeah. uh, actually, one of the stories in there convinced me not to buy a house in panic mode because I was listening to 2019 version of myself being like, Shannon, listen to your own self when you're not <laughs> undone. You know what I mean? So, yeah, they're all real. Micro goals and micro timelines. Yes. What are those? Yeah, so this is a great way to make sure that you are also not panicking. Um, so again, coming back to that, when your life gets turned upside down or something happens, it can be really overwhelming when you're like, oh, I have to decide this and this. And what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. So if you hear yourself, your internal monologue being like, well, what if this, what if this, what if this, what if this, it means that you're spiraling a little bit on like so many possible outcomes with uncertainty. It feels scary. And that can often lead to panic-based decisions to just stop overthinking things, right? Like we just want it to end. We just are sick of waffling um, on stuff. So if we set micro timelines and micro goals, it's like the illusion of control. Hmm. Um, How micro is micro? I have made three week plans for people and I actually one time made a four day plan um, and that was just to buy time until we had more information. So a lot of a micro plan, especially when it comes to money, like that's how I get dragged into all of these really intense conversations is that at the end of the day, money is a constraint. And so someone might come to me and say like, can I afford to do this or, or what's gonna happen to me now? And so when I make a micro timeline for someone, it's like, okay, when do we when do we have more information? So sometimes that's four days from now, sometimes it's four months from now. And it's like, okay, well, let's just control what we can with the information we have now, do the least amount of damage that we can for like put off whatever decisions we can do the least amount of financial damage get to where we have more information and then we'll go from there so mm. often that's really helpful it takes the problem from this big to this big and it's like okay i just need to wait for more information i just need to get through this time so it takes us it gives us that sense of control and the micro goals are just small steps that you can take during that small timeline that kind of move the dial forward so you don't create a, you don't exacerbate a situation that's already scary mm. You know, whenever I'm watching a football game and a coach decides to go for it, if it's an NFL game on fourth down, the first thing I always say is, well, what's the worst case scenario here? Yeah. What, what if, 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 you know, everything that could go wrong does go wrong, what is that, how does that inform the decision I'm about to make on whether to gamble on fourth down? Got to be the same thing for financial planning, right? Yes, always. So what's the, what, do you do you take your people through worst case scenarios on yeah. how things work? Oh my gosh, okay. yes. How and do you handle that? Yeah, that's often in the messy, in the messy middle. So mm -hmm. often our worst case scenario, what I'm listening for are the values that are being violated for someone. Like, why is that your worst case scenario? Not my worst case scenario. Like, if I look back to that me moving out of out of my house scenario, like my, my values were different than someone else's. So if we're talking about a worst case scenario, Yes, sometimes it's financial, but also sometimes there's emotional like values that are being violated in that. And then I'll often write them down like, okay, well, you're scared about this becoming the re your next normal, your reality, because uh, financial security is, you know, um, at risk. So obviously financial security is a, is a value for yours. You won't see your, your you, you know, you don't get access to your kids or you don't see, see someone here or this happens to you. And then if we flip those out, then it's actually like, well, these are your core values that are being violated in your worst case scenario. Mm. And you're hoping to be upheld in your best case. And then what I'll do is one step further and say, cool, we all have lots of core values. Of course we do. What's the one you're going to hang your hat on for this decision? So sure, of course, like your family time is a, is a core value and financial security and, 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 and. Mm. But choose one. <laughs> choose one so that even if this doesn't work out, you can look back and say, Mindfully, I went through everything in my worst case scenario and I realized that for this decision, even though financial security is really important to me, it's secondary to family or my financial security value is primary in this decision because it's gonna impact my family. So I have to put that as my top line deciding value. So the worst case scenario is used for me to draw out those core values and then prioritize them so that someone can hang their hat on something proudly and look back without regret. I don't know if this is the worst example of the worst case scenario, but it's certainly a tough one from the book. And that is, 
How do you advise people on, on what decision to make when somebody's got a terminal illness mm -hmm. and they have to they have to decide whether they want to spend their entire life savings on whether to try to save that person who might be dead in six months. Yeah, like caregiving, becoming a caregiver, um, or the person themselves, whether or not they, it, like it depends if it's the person who actually has, been, has the diagnosis and then also the caregiver. I do a lot of work with caregivers and I think it's one of the, the most difficult financial situations yeah. um, because the emotional stakes are so high and most people want to um we call it like lighting yourself on financial fire to keep someone warm mm -hmm. and so that's where those um pivot points and guardrails i use this as a tactic to uh, and this they talk i talk about this in the book but those are the key words that i use and so i'll really define the difference along the way so it's like a pivot point in their financial life is where okay so we're spending money on this situation and a pivot point is when you reach a, a block where other things in your life need to shift, and some, but you still have you still have options. So maybe that's move or sell the house or um, you know retire or go back to work. These kinds of big lifestyle shifts and changes, but not out of we're not out of options. You still just, got options. We're pivoting, right? So we'll map those out. Okay, so how much can I spend until I have to get a job? How much can I spend past that until I need to sell the house? How much? So again, we're just mapping it out. I'm not. I'm not making the decision for them. I'm just mapping out the reality. And then we'll put in a guardrail, which is like, we've pivoted as far as we can. And that we're out of time or money because these are our constraints in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we've hit the rail. And so that rail is in place to make sure that you don't look back and say, I regret everything that I did because now I'm destitute. So we're, and they set that with me. So at the start, we map out the pivot points, what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do. And then we set a time and money guardrail to say how long are you going to go and how much are you going to spend until you're it's complete devastation right how many people blow past the guardrails uh, pivot points all the time guardrails um it depends i obviously it happens sometimes and then i say well that was a pivot point wasn't it <laughs> right just change the that's right definition. we changed the definition yeah. so you thought this was your ideal <laughs> guardrail it wasn't a real one. It was just a pivot point with a pivot that you really didn't want to make. So a lot of people see the selling of the house as that guardrail. Mm. And then when push comes to shove, it's just a pivot point. Right. Uh, a question now more, I guess, about coaching as opposed to financial planning. But it, w when people get into one of those situations where they've made a decision and it hasn't worked out, and it's not a no regret decision, and it turns out it's a bad decision, <laughs> and, and down the road you realize you actually have a lot of regrets about that. Yeah. How, how do you kind of coach people back to uh, like a, an emotionally healthy place to yeah, be? Yeah, a place of confidence. Yeah. Um, I think, because that's what's at stake, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I regret the takeout order last week, that's not going to impact my decisions Correct. going forward. But if I if I think that I've made horrible life decisions, you know, that's, that's, this, that's really scary. Sometimes you don't get those back. Right. And so we're talking about that level of confidence, shaking confidence. And so... I would ask them, for, well, normally what I do is I'll say like, okay, you know, what's the proof here? Do you always make bad decisions? Because often I know that this has happened to someone when I hear the way they talk about themselves, right? I, it's immediate. I am bad with money. I, I make bad decisions. Like, I don't want to screw this up. Like, there's all kinds of, there's that technical term again. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of words that people use with self-negative talk about themselves. And I'm like, okay, like, where, what happened? Why do you feel like this about yourself? And often what I'll do is say like, okay, do you realize the impact of that, that view of yourself that you can't make, you can't trust yourself to make good decisions. And what's that, what's the impact of that having on you going forward? Not the past, like going forward. Sometimes even just naming that, putting a finger on that is like, oh, I didn't realize that that's like coloring everything about my life. And then when we look back to whatever thread, I often like, I'm like, what thread are we tugging at here? You know, like this decision that then led to all of these outcomes that you don't like about your current life. And we'll hone it back to whatever that, that thread of that story is and say like, okay, well at the time, I'm sure there was a reason you made that decision. Even if you regret it, what was the reason? And we'll really talk about it. You're and really drilling down here. You've got to get to the nub of the, the thing. What is that decision that you yeah. made that you blame yourself for that has now led to a next normal that you despise? Mm. You're, you don't like your life. So what is it? And then we'll list out why they made that decision at the time. And even if it was a panic-based decision, I'm like, hey, you were scared. Great. People make scared decisions all the time. Or they were reacting to something or they were angry at someone. Like, cool, you're human. 
congratulations. <laughs> and it's like when you kind of look at it that way and we list the reason and they can forgive themselves for it a little bit and it makes it a little bit easier to say, okay, well, I was really angry at the time. And then the, the big lesson is like, well, that was then and this is now. And now you know to watch out for that and you're not going to do it again. Has this process helped you in your own life decisions? Yes. Absolutely. This book is a love letter. <laughs> I, I, this is my third book and I love all of my books, but this one is the most I'm the most emotionally connected to because I wrote it during my own weird time during COVID with, the, with a baby and a toddler um, during the first lockdowns. And so it was a weird time for everybody. And I was listening to these stories from my clients from before in the before times um, and writing it. So it almost felt like a diary. And I, like I said, ch chapter seven actually stopped me from buying a house and moving yeah. out of my home, uh, yeah. listening to myself. So there's that. And I also feel like when I wanted to write this book before the pandemic started, like it is just dumb luck that things are so uncertain right now. I wanted to write this book back in like 2019 because of all of the decisions people make in my office and like the trend I see around that regret really eating into confidence. And I feel like laying it out in a playbook like this book has helped me even in my own life when I'm talking to my friends, when I'm talking to my family, when I'm talking to my husband around making decisions, we have sometimes we joke, it's like order pizza, no regret decision. <laughs> and then other times it's like, pull your kid out of daycare, like pull your, do this. Like, like it's like big, those big conversations are like, are you gonna leave your job? Are we gonna do this? And it's like, what's our no regret decision? And then we really now, poor Matt, he's very well versed in his deciding values. <laughs> <laughs> poor Matt is your husband. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of yeah. How many years? Uh, well, we've been together for 17, but we've been married for nine. Good for you. Yeah. Well, you know our no regret decision? Having you on this show. Oh, that's so always, kind. Always, always. You're always a delight. No Regret Decisions is Shannon Lee Simmons' latest, making good choices during difficult times, and we're delighted that it's brought her back to TVO for tonight's program. Thanks so much, SLS. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, March the 8th, 2023. Remember all those adorable pandemic pets people so eagerly adopted? Well, tomorrow, the sad news of where some of them are now ending up. And just before we go, we wanted to draw your attention to two new playlists on our YouTube page in celebration of International Women's Day. We've highlighted past conversations with trailblazing women on everything from science to economics to democratic politics. You can check those conversations out at youtube.com slash the agenda. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.